So to be fair, I got a text from uh, Terrell yesterday. Yeah. Yesterday. Yeah. So that was two days ago in today's time because this is coming out on Tuesday. And Terrell was in Chocolate City. He was in the nation's capital uh-huh. watching a little WNBA, watching our under machine, a.k.a. the D.C. Mystics. Uh, Washington Mystics versus the Chicago Sky. And I said, why not have him in the studio? We can talk a little NBA draft here. Yeah. So without further ado, Terrell Furman, again, host of the NBA and WNBA Sports Gambling Podcast. Check that out on the Sports Gambling Podcast Network. But you can get it on Spotify as well, right? Yeah, you can get it on Spotify. You can get wherever, wherever you, you get find your podcast, your podcast. Anywhere, YouTube. Hey, do both. YouTube, Spotify, Apple, do all of it. I all need it. all those downloads. Com- complete yep. com- combination. For every single device. You know what I think people should do, too, is like just go into the Apple store yeah. and uh, download the podcast to the Apple phones. Oh, podcast? Yeah. Hey, go download the app. The app is in the Apple store, too. SGP and app. So, Love it. Hey, I, I, I take any type of support you can get. It's free. What is your overall, I guess, vibe of this draft? Stardom. This feels like stardom because you have the next carnation of Jesus walking on earth, who is Victor Wimbignana. That has everybody made it seem like he's just automatically going to be great. And for one, if he's not good the first year, guys, please give him some time. He's still a center. Like center is a hard position to learn in the NBA. But you have him then you have scoot henderson who was a guy that if you ask anybody who watches scoot henderson he is a number one overall pick but unfortunately because jesus reincarnated walked the earth again in victor and he is now being talked about in number two with brandon miller you go even further down and we'll talk about a guy that i like who was number one overall high school recruit and he's sliding in the draft so this is just a draft full of stardom hmm. yeah and i think i wonder because there's so many teams that are rumored to be moving up and down the board that you wonder, is it a deep draft? Is it like a three, four person star draft Mm -hmm. with a lot of good role players? Like if you were to assess how many guys outside of the top three actually start year one, what do you think? Outside of the top three? I I think you have a lot of qualities. I think that where the issue is going to come is everybody wants to see those starters come in and average 20 points per game. If you're a big, you're already a double-double territory. I should be betting your double-double every game. Like, Evan Mobley, look at Evan Mobley now. He is a really, really good starter. In his first year, you were like, okay, like, this guy's all right. He averaged 16, 17. That's, that's really good for that's an NBA player. That's pretty good for a rookie. That's really good for a rookie NBA player. Like, Paolo Bancaro, dude, he's been really, really good, and he's getting better. Like, he's going to be better next year. You, we have Chet Holcomb, who we haven't even seen yet. Like, they're, all these players in the NBA, people want them to just come in and be those all-star 20-plus, 30-plus per game scorers, and it's not just going to happen like that. Like, it takes time to actually develop a player like they did Evan Mobley in Cleveland, and now Evan Mobley next year could be knocking on the door all-star sound. Yeah, you talk about Evan Mobley, and that is just an interesting thing about bigs and, and bigs taking a long time yeah. to develop. Also, O'Shea Akbaji, yeah. like he came on late. He was really good. I really, I liked him a lot at Kansas, so it's going to be fascinating to see how many guys come in and contribute right away. Another uh, storyline that's kind of circulating is just All these teams that have needs and they think Mm -hmm. are going to be active, right? OKC is rumored to want to move up. Mm -hmm. New York uh, Knicks are rumored to want to go. No, no, they're not. They're not. You don't think they're they're going to get a first round pick? Nobody wants to come to New York. Nobody wants to come to New York. Okay. Toronto rumored to to move up. Okay. Cleveland rumored to move up. If you had to give a guess, who do you think that's not in the top 10 now moves into the top 10? Go to state. Wow. Easily. If you're Dunleavy, you ha- you have to make a splash. You have to. Bob Myers gave this organization four championships? Four? Like, if you're Dunleavy, you got to make a splash. And saying that Jordan Poole is coming back for the next four years is not the way to make that splash as the first active new GM power in Golden State. I think it's 100% Golden State. I think Golden State saw buyers at the tr- at the uh, draft and they find their way in the top 10. Wow, like who? Who do you think they who do you think they make a trade with? Cuz it can't be 10. I don't think Mavericks need uh, a Jordan Poole. They're it, not going to probably try to move up for uh, Yeah. Today. I, th- I mean, I wouldn't be pick. surprised because they, they could use some more depth, um, especially for Dallas. But I'm looking at teams that kind of 
either got rid of their picks or they're just in this mode of stockpiling picks. Utah just feels like a team that's like, well, I mean, we're going nowhere fast, guys, so we might as well trade back. So Utah at nine is like the number one team I'm looking at. Washington didn't get a first round pick for Bradley Beal. We're gonna talk about that. But like that would be interesting. A, so Washington could could move back. Or Washington could just be a buyer and get somebody really good there. But Washington could move back. It's a couple of teams up there that I think would move back with a Golden State and Golden State take a Derek Lively the second, you know, probably the best defensive big in the draft class. So you really like Derek Lively that hold on, let me let me wait on that one because mm -hmm. I think an interesting trade could be Wizards trade Chris Paul for and whatever Chris Paul and the eight pick mm -hmm. for Jordan Poole and whatever yeah. Golden State has in yeah, their first I mean, round I were think, they 17 18 I think and Chris Paul said he wants to go to a contender and still compete 19 so, you know he'll, that's a, definitely in the wrong possibility I think Chris Paul makes everything fun because you autumn like he he's worth some type of value everybody wants to devalue chris paul and i completely understand it but he's worth some type of value so that with the first round pick is enticing to get a player that can come into your organization and play now so we'll see but oh man the dc team very very poverty organization so i don't think they'll do anything that's any benefit to them you don't think even with Michael Winger coming in from the Clippers, which, by the way, the Clippers have made some really bad draft mm -hmm. moves as well, underratedly mm -hmm. bad draft moves. Obviously, moving Shea was a, was a terrible uh, trade. Not only moving Shea, but giving up every single pick. And Shea. <laughs> like, Seven picks plus so, Shea. So That's like 11 show, picks. We talked about it, and we talked about the worst trades one day, and we said Rudy Gobert probably is going to go down as the worst trade ever, but nobody's talking about how bad that Paul George trade was. And the fact that now Shea is a first teamer and he could potentially he almost led his team to the playoffs. Like he almost led to his team to the playoffs. So I, I don't know. That that Paul George trade is pretty, pretty bad. Yeah. So okay, so let's talk a little bit about some of the teams that we think might be active. So what do you think Orlando's trying to do? And and how do you think they're trying to prioritize this draft? Because Paolo said mm -hmm. already that this year they have six and eleven. Mm -hmm. Uh Paolo said this year is playoffs or bust. I really think this is a young team. We know that they've got the sixth pick and the 11th pick. So do they package those picks to maybe try to get up into the top three, four? Do they sell off one of those picks for a veteran? Like, what do you think? And obviously they're in need of a point guard, mm -hmm. even though they have a million of them. They still need that, and they need rim protection. So if you were to be a, a better for what Orlando does, what do you think they do? I think Orlando's in the situation where you can kind of just let the draft board fall to you, honestly. Like, if you want to make a splash play and go trade up into that top four, and it seems like, well, we know number one's not trading, and Charlotte has maintained that they're not going to trade their pick. I just saw today that Portland said they're probably not going to trade their pick. I wouldn't be surprised if Houston tried to trade, but right now, the top four – None of the top four teams are hurting for picks. Like, everybody has an assortment of picks over the next few years, and that's what I'm looking for for teams that are looking to trade out of that top 10 spot is what teams do not have picks coming up that would say, okay, we can get another first-rounder this year, and I can get a first-rounder next year and replace some of those picks. And so uh, I think they hold serve. I think they hold serve, and they just let it come to them. Like, you have a pretty good chance at number six, to get one of the twins, well, the uh, lesser twin, as some people say, Asar. So you still have a chance to get him. You have a chance to get Cam Whitmore. You still have Anthony Black. Uh, it, it's a lot of really, really good players. You talk about rim, uh, rim protection. Derek Lively's going to be in there somewhere, and that's one of my teams that I have Lively going to, if not trade at a 11. trade. Yeah, maybe at 11. I, I don't think they, they would back? jump at 6, but maybe at 11 he could be there at 11 and just offer you that rim protection. Like everybody that needs rim protection – Dallas, Utah, Orlando, everybody should be looking at Derek Lively in that 8 to 11 range. So I can see something like that, but I don't think they – I just can't see them making a trade with anybody unless somebody comes from behind and gives them two, three extra picks. What do you think Derek Lively is going to be? Because the big man position is, mm -hmm. is so polarizing, right? And you've got Derek Lively who's sort of kind of been creeping up the draft boards. A yeah. lot of teams like him. I'm just not a big fan of taking big men in the top 10, top 12 period because mm. there's just such big bust potential, right? Like, yeah. I love Jalen Duran, but I don't know that you should have taken him there. We'll see what he ends up being. Like, James Wiseman hasn't mm. worked out. Like, 
a lot of these big men that are in the lottery don't end up working out very often right away. What do you what do you like most about him? I, I like him more because of the situation that he could potentially go to and less about the player. So the player is an amazing player. We know he's a shot blocker, averaged like f some 5.6 rebounds in, a whole bunch of blocks over at, during his time in Duke. I hate the Dukies. But that's like but, Mark Williams, too, and he yeah. was just trash in Charlotte. Yeah, but it's like it's the timing. Bigs take time to develop to the league. Like, you can't just come into the— Paolo can come into the league and he can give the league 20. Like, if you watch Paolo in summer league, you watch mm -hmm. Paolo in his rookie year, every one of his buckets were grown, man, I'm going to get a bucket bucket. Bigs don't get that opportunity. Like, you have to learn defensive setups. You have to learn how to switch over. You got to learn the pick and roll and being able to guard the pick and roll. Like, you got to learn all this stuff as a big. And that doesn't just come in one season. Like, a lot of that is trial and error. Like, Rudy Gobert didn't come in and he look, didn't look like a defensive player a year his first year. Draymond Green didn't look like a defensive player a year his first year. Like, some of that stuff takes time. And so the issue that I had with Golden State when it was time and they picked Wiseman, was it a great pick for them? Yes, because they needed size. But there was no way Golden State was waiting for that because they're in a win now mode, yeah, win now situation. mode, win now mode. Terrible situation. But now Wiseman over there, and same thing with Durant. Them in Detroit, well, we don't got nothing to wait for. If y'all want to take three, four years, then fine. Bite, be all that. So that's what I expect to see from Lively and somebody take from Lively because I think organizations understand that these bigs, you got to be patient with them. And if you're not going to be patient, you don't need to take them. So... A team like Orlando that's not going anywhere fast, no matter how much Paolo wants to say that they are, they really, really aren't. Okay, they can take and invest more into them. A Golden State that is literally looks like they're kind of retooling things. We just saw Draymond may potentially not be coming back. Is that news? Is that not news? We'll talk about it. But, I mean, Derek Lively could be good there. And a Golden State team that says, hey, we need a year or two to reset this thing. But just expecting him to come in and be this ultimate dominant defensive thing, I don't think it's going to happen. Why do you think Walker Kessler developed so fast? I think it's because he's a his offensive game and he was able to stretch the floor in how he was with that Utah Jazz team where it was go, 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 go. He was a big that can run the floor. He was a big that... Uh, in Art Auburn, he was able to be able more on the offensive side and less about defense. Like we didn't really think of Walker Kessler as this big defensive shot blocking and big, then, like a Air, yeah. like a Evan Mobley. No, it was just more of, hey, this is another guy that's going to be able to spread the floor with us. At the time, they thought they still had Rudy Gobert, so it was like, okay, Rudy Gobert anchors. We have this kind of big lineup, and but Rudy Gobert goes, all right, we bring in Walker Kessler. Walker Kessler is going to help us get more and more offense. So that was a lot easier for him. And then he's just a big guy, so he's able to dominate rebounding. But some of the little key things, like as a big, Kessler still has to work on, but they but didn't need he, it from him. I think he led the NBA, though, in blocks. He was, yeah. a, he was a defensive monster. Yeah, and so I think that Kessler is now kind I think that's kind of where everybody wants you to be is that kind of big that kind of comes in and turns it over quickly but on a lot of other rosters does he get that same opportunity to do that probably not I think right. it just he, he got the perfect situation with no Rudy Gobert in Utah where they just said forget it Hardy was just like go play yeah go play go go do something because we're not going to just sit here and tank all these games. And that's part of the reason why Utah was the best team as an underdog last season. Utah Jazz are inevitable. So let's quickly shift backward to the Wizards because we didn't get to it. Obviously a rebuilding team, new GM, new completely new front office, same exact owner. Mm -hmm. uh, they have the eighth pick. Like They definitely need a guard. And we talked about this via text. They need a scoring guard. But I know that I'm seeing Osser Thompson get mocked there too. Uh, because of his upside, yeah. would that be a mistake to you? Would that surprise you? Uh, and like, what do you think they actually do versus should do? I don't think it's a mistake because All Star Thompson is still a really good player. Like at this point, where they're at in the draft at eight, like there's not many mistakes that you can be made, yeah. and it's just more of wait and see because all these guys look really, really good right now. But guess what? That's what everybody in every NBA draft looks. Everybody looks really, really good right now. It just depends on when you get to the league how you. Uh, train that player how you develop that player and so uh, a guy that I had as a long shot was Nick Smith Nick Smith Jr. from Arkansas he this guy was number one overall recruited talent number one overall recruited talent last year and then he comes had a flare-up with his knee in the offseason missed like six games early on came in had some really good outings and then his knee flared up again 
And that kind of took away his explosiveness last year. And people were saying his tank dropped. And they were like, he should have just never played. He would have just had the college hype. And he still would have been a top pick. Now, there's some mocks that have him sliding to the, yeah, to the 20s. And it's like, this guy is still the uh, first over. Like, in a year time, you can't go from number one overall in your class to now sliding into the 20s of the draft. So that's why I just think he's an interesting person that... He had a really good workout with Washington. He had a really good workout with Toronto. And look, just listen to the last few number one overall recruits in the draft class, starting with Anthony Davis in 2011. He went number one overall. Nerlens Noel, number six. Andrew Wiggins, number one. Emmanuel Mude, Lord. Oh, I hate the two? Knicks. He went seven to the seven. Knicks. To the Knicks. It, it, Terrible. It, and then I think they traded him to actually Denver. So I think he was at Denver mm-hmm. sometime there. But he goes... Uh, to Denver. Then you have Ben Simmons, number one overall. Josh Jackson, number four. Marvin Bagley, number two. R.J. Barrett, number three. And Anthony Edwards, number one. Kate Cunningham, number one. Chet Holgram, number two. And then you have Nick Sniff here for 2022. Everybody here is a top 10 pick, like regardless. And so while I get it, but if you just, if you're telling me that it's just a physical, if he, he just has to pass a physical and the team doc says, oh, this guy is clear cut, good to go. Everybody thinks he's like one of the best scorers in this draft. Hmm. And so you just traded away an all world scorer in Bradley Beal. It makes so much sense to just say, all right, we're going to play scoring and scoring. Doctor said Nick Smith is healthy. This was just a one year thing that knee is going to be good going forward. Why are we not going to take somebody who is explosive that can score on all three levels? So Nick Smith fa- finding his way into the top 10 after Literally, almost every single mock draft has him not even in the top 15. I think Nick Smith is somebody to watch out for, especially with Washington, because it sounds like they liked him from his workout. Do you like Nick Smith more than Anthony Black, who is also his teammate at Arkansas? Because I really like Anthony Black's Mm -hmm. playmaking. Uh, He kind of feels like a Josh Giddy to me. Mm -hmm. Obviously not a great shooter, but plays incredible defense. He gets steals, deflections, big body. I think he's, what, 6'6", 6'7". Do you you like Nick Smith more for... It depends what I need. Yeah. What what do I need? Do I need a playmaker or do I need a scorer? Because sometimes I just need a scorer that'll go out there and get a bucket. And, I mean, you have Kyle Kuzma over there. They do need to... They'll probably get rid of them, though, right? Yeah. You think at KP some point, and Kuzma I think at, at some point you probably should just to reload. You didn't get a first-round pick for Bradley Beal. You got to start reloading. And if you're going to commit to the... That's the the issue that I have with some teams is they don't want to commit to the rebuild. They kind of want to be one in, one foot in, one foot out. Portland, the definition of one foot, one foot out to the rebuild. Are we in a rebuild? No, because we have Dame Lillard. Should we be in a rebuild? Absolutely. All these teams that are now trying to commit to the rebuild after the greatest prospect that everybody says since LeBron James is now gone is really, really crazy to me. But I think that it depends on what I'm looking for between those two. If I'm looking for somebody that's a pure scorer and I just need I don't need you to do all these other aspects of the game. I don't really need you for defense. I feel like that I can coach up defense or I have a good defensive team overall. I just need somebody that in the last minute of the game that I can go to to get a bucket. I'm going to go with Nick Smith because I, I think he if he develops right with the right staff, he could be one of those guys that can lead the league in scoring one day. Yeah, like Bradley Beal did a yeah. couple of years ago. And I think funny. they were a playing team. Hey, you know, the Wizards should actually try to get a guy like Bradley Beal. They should see if he's on the market. <laughs> Speaking of guards, uh, a guy who may not make it to 11, I think he's fascinating. He's really not discussed much. And I think it's because... Like Kentucky guys just always fly under the radar. It's Calipari. crazy. Calipari really he makes does sell these te- like these players short. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, you had a couple of twins and uh, that were I forget their twins' names. And Devin Booker was just sitting mm-hmm. sitting there. Yeah, as like Aaron the, Wiggins yeah, and Andrew Wiggins. Yeah, yep. both Wiggins and like Devin Booker's just sitting there as a fourth option, mm-hmm. right? You had Carl uh, Anthony Towns. You had he like barely shot any threes with yep. Kentucky. You yep. had Emmanuel Quickly who. Like, all of a sudden, now he's a scoring machine. Tyrese Maxey Mm -hmm. fell in the draft. Bam Adebayo slightly fell in the draft. All these guys are very, very good NBA players. Mm -hmm. So, Case and Wallace, I'm fascinated to get your take on. Because a team like Utah could really use him. A team like Detroit, who needs Mm -hmm. a guard, even though they're fifth, probably that would be a reach. Team like the Rockets. Team like the uh, Raptors as well. Mocked 8-15. to Yep. Top 10, not top 10, best fit. Dallas. Dallas. It tells me Dallas because I don't think Kyrie's staying, and I think they know. Really? I, I, if Kyrie leaves, even if Kyrie doesn't leave, they still need the backup guard depth. But I think 
I think Ky- there's a more than not chance that Kyrie decides not to stay with Dallas. And if you don't, then how Jason Kidd's run that offense with Jalen Brunson and Luka, with Kyrie and What about Jaden Hardy? Like, uh, Jaden Hardy, they don't, they don't trust him. Yeah. They clearly don't trust him. And maybe it's because the defensive side of all, but it. you remember when Kyrie first got there and there was this stretch where it was either Kyrie playing or Luka playing, and then Josh Green was stepping up, Jaden Hardy was stepping up. But as soon as Luka and Kyrie were back in the lineup, Josh, Hart's, Josh Green's minutes went down, Jaden Hardy didn't even see the floor. So... Yeah. It, Casey it Wallace just, can play defense now. Yeah, and so that's what I think that that's something really good for a Jason Kidd. If you sit here and say, all right, we're not going to be able to retain Tyree, uh, Kyrie. It was very good experiment. We tried to make it work. It didn't work. Fine, we're moving on. Casey Wallace is a guy that I would love to have next to Luka that can also handle the ball. Mm-hmm. Like, There's so much importance of having two capable ball handlers in today's NBA. And you saw it with the Mavericks run to the Western Conference Finals the year prior with Jalen Brunson. And now look at Jalen Brunson. He went and got a bag and went to New York and played really, really well. It's because there's so much stock in having two point guards, two capable ball handlers that will be able to keep the offense flowing and not get into trap situations, stuck situations, kind of get stagnant with the ball. So I think that a sleeper pick for me is Dallas, but I can absolutely see a Utah saying, no, we're not letting this guy go go past, especially with the Colin Sexton experiment seeming like it didn't work. Yeah, and they say they're still committed to Colin Sexton because he was working through some injury issues, but I'm not so convinced. I, I, sometimes it's just a bad taste in your yeah. mouth. And the, the best form of ability is availability, and yeah. sometimes some people aren't there. He just never is. Another fascinating player that I've seen go – as high in mocks as four and as low in mocks as like eight. And I love this kid. He's a kid who started off injured, but mm-hmm. ended up being a real difference maker for Villanova, Cam Whitmore. Yeah. I think he's bouncy. I think he's big. I think he'd be a phenomenal fit for the Rockets. I think he'd be really good for Detroit. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, do you think he makes it out of the top five? Or do you think he is a top five guy? So that's that's what I've been struggling with. It's And that's what I was looking up today and trying to figure out what I like today was, I'm pretty sure Eamon Thompson goes before him. Is he better than the other Thompson brother? That's my question, How many too. Player, that's, and that's really the question of, that betters of the draft are looking for, that just fans of the sport. How many players, what is the gap between Eamon Thompson and Asar Thompson? What is the gap there? Is it just a Cam Whitmore? Is it that these brothers are so good that they're going back to back? I think that Cam Whitmore might be the gap player in between them that keeps them from going back so to back. So four, six. Yeah, yeah. So and then, five. and then five. And that's what it feels like to me. Maybe he falls a little bit less than six. Maybe it just wasn't the right fit. But I, I, I think Cam Whitmore is definitely in contention for four, but Amen is going to win out, and then I think Cam Whitmore goes to Detroit at five. How much better is Cam Whitmore than Sadiq Bey? I think I think substantially better just in the fact of... Explosiveness. Yeah, explosiveness. Wingspan. And, and just maybe it's not really more of the fault of Sadiq Bey, but just how he was coached. He was just coached to be a one-track pony. Like, I'm going to try to hit a bunch of threes. But if you look at him, especially when he got to the Hawks, he mm-hmm. was slashing more to the rim. Back cuts look amazing. Mm-hmm. Like Sadiq Bay got to ex- do more in the Hawks offense under Quinn Snyder. Got to do a lot more with Quinn Snyder. So now I think Cam Whitmore does he is, fit Monty's system? Yeah, and possibly does. I think that Monty's gonna have a really really good time with this. Just the young talent and having all these options to go to instead of having to pigeonhole it through a Devin Booker who. Yes, I would love to have the problem of I got to find a way to make Devin Booker work in offense. But now you don't have that star, but that's so much more freeing because everybody can touch the ball. Everybody can, and you can go around all five players until. As long as Jaden Ivey's not that guy. <laughs> yeah, Jaden Ivey's not passing, but uh, <laughs> it, it can touch four out of the five guys yep. and then in with Ivey on a good percentage look. And that's what I like about the Pistons this year that I think no matter what they go at five, they're going to pass the ball so much, and he's going to get them playing together that they're going to get the best look possible. You With- think Osser is a bad fit because he can't shoot? That no. shot is ugly. No, but I. It's, but he does so much else. Like, yeah. He's a playmaker. Mm-hmm. He's a. He can defend. He can he do point all of these other things. I. I. I think you want to. I don't know if point guard is the term. You know, Rashad Phillips, and he has yeah. this position. I, I don't think a point guard is the right term for him. Is it like but point forward? Is it like maybe like a, a hybrid, kind of like a hybrid combo? And of course, like 
not having a shot right now is probably the best thing for you in today's NBA because so many players are working on their shot outside of Ben Simmons. Right. Everybody else is working on their shot and making their shot a better shot. Like even the greats, LeBron James didn't have a good shot at first. And even in about halfway of his career, still didn't have a good shot. Now his shot feels a lot better. He's found something. And even though it's probably one of the ugliest three-pointers I've ever seen, it works for him. Yep. And so now, and that was the same thing with the Dylan Brooks situation. Everybody was talking about Dylan Brooks. Well, if shooting is your only issue, you can work on that. So many players worked on that. Jimmy Butler shoots the ball a lot better than when he started. Mm -hmm. So where, with Asar, I feel like you just got to be committed to him. Because mm -hmm. if you look at him, you're like, hey, if we get this guy a shot, he, he could surpass insane. his brother. Yeah. That's the only thing that he could surpass his brother. So, and, and I think that's probably the reason why he didn't work on his shot as much is because, hey, if I'm playing with Amen every single team, I just get the ball to him and he go ahead and does it. I'm he, and that's why I like Asar in the draft so much because looking of what he played, how he played with his brother for so long, he's so unselfish. Yeah, such an unselfish player. And so, if you put a bunch of guys that can score around him. Uh, and that's why I'm really like I'm torn at five between him and Cam because insert him into that lineup with Detroit and you put a Kate Cunningham who's going to have fun playing off the ball yep. with them a Jay and Ivy who's always looking to score you have the bigs down low that he can get the ball to and he and can they handle look really good yes I I don't know man I'm really torn I don't know where I want to go at five if I was Cam Whitmore to Asar but I think both of them fit that system really really well another player who I love who I think is super versatile big can do a bunch of things, probably would have scored a lot more if he didn't play for Houston as Jairus Walker. Mm -hmm. He is getting mocked a lot to the Pacers. Mm -hmm. Some people think he'll go earlier, like 5'6". Some mm -hmm. people think maybe 9'10". Uh, what do you think he ends up, where do you think he ends up going? Where do you think his best fit is? I think the Pacers is a good fit, just defensively and what he, what he learned at Houston, what he's able to do at Houston. Again, Dallas, another good fit. That I, I, I don't think Dallas, everybody is mocking lively to Dallas. I think there's some Grady Dicks out there too to Dallas, but I, I don't think they go oh my big. God, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know, but uh, <laughs> that would be that would be a killer for Nico Harrison if they don't get some defense. Yeah, and and that's what or I'm a expecting. Ball handler. I'm expecting like somebody, like somebody else outside of what everybody's saying. And a walk, a Walker is somebody like that that could fall just because they say. Hey, we're trying to score, score, score. The Pacers, like, this is Rick Carlisle we're talking about. Yeah. Rick Carlisle doesn't care about defense. Rick Carlisle said, I don't care if you're scoring 110 points. My team will score 120. And so that could be something that, hey, we're not interested in a walker because of that. And that's fine. But if he falls and he gets to somebody, like, I, I'm throwing Dallas out here a lot. But because I, I feel Utah. like Dallas. Yeah, even in Utah, Utah terrible defense as well. Like, I'm throwing these teams out there, especially Dallas. One, because Dallas... Tank for a reason. I think they put they wanted 10 for a reason. They already been planning this way back before the Knicks were even considered at taking their as taking their pick if it fell to 11 or anything like that. So I think they planned for this and they're going to make some type of splashy move. Everybody thinks it's a big. I'm not you don't sure think they'll trade big. that pick. I, I, I think they I they could. Like, I think that there's so many things, especially with you just trading for Kyrie, like you can get something back. Remember, I talked about play, teams that are trying to get something back. They very well could, but I just think Dallas is the team I'm watching out for where I think they're going to do something that nobody expected, whether it's trading back, whether it's going and getting a player that somebody didn't expect, like a Walker or anybody else that we talked about today, like I think Dallas is the biggest wild card because they just feel like we're playing with house money. We have Luka Doncic. Yeah. I'm I'm also curious about Grady Dick because, boy, oh, boy, will this matter where he goes. You mm -hmm. know, the fit is going to be key, mm -hmm. very critical. I've seen him as high as being reached for by Orlando. Yeah. I've seen uh, at six. I've seen him getting mocked in the 11th pick to Orlando at six. Falls. You think he falls? I think he falls. I don't know if everybody's. Why if everybody is he commits. so polarizing? I think it's. I think is it the we, North American white boy thing? And, and it possibly could be. It possibly because it's be. like, like he's not that but, athletic, but he's kind of sneaky athletic, which just means he's white. And I think Christian Braun just helped him out. <laughs> yeah, I think Christian Braun. If if he gets into the top ten, I think he definitely should be sending an invoice Christian Braun's way because now they saw what Christian Braun did. In that playoff run, especially in the finals. And he can do finals. more than Christian Brown. And he can. He is and a really it, elite shooter. And that's what it is. Like, you're not just... So if you're getting the toughness and you're getting everything you wanted about Christian Brown, you add somebody that can shoot. Movement think, shooter, too. Yeah, like, oh, man. I think everybody's going to be looking for him. Do I? But 
is everybody going to take that chance? And, and him just being that guy. The difference between Christian Brown and Grady Dick is that you have to kind of hide Grady Dick in your defense, and yeah. you don't for Christian Brown. And it's the fact that Brown has low expectations. If mm-hmm. you take Dick top 10, you're going to expect for him to be Tyler Hero think, in the bubble. Was 13, gonna, 14? Yeah, like back into the lottery. I don't think it's – like he's not sliding. I'm not going to say like he goes all the way to the Lakers at 17 or anything like that. Like I Which think would be a steal. Yeah, 100%. But I think he's back into the lottery there, and he's somewhere around that range. He's not necessarily top oh, 10. Oh, Baji range. Yeah, maybe maybe a second Orlando pick. So uh, you feel comfortable. Maybe you don't go Lively's way. Or maybe you take Lively early because you think that Dick is going to fall to you at 11. Fine. Like I, I think that's a possibility as well. But – Somebody with just a little able that says that, hey, we can take this chance because all these teams up towards the top cannot afford another mess up. Yeah. Like there's jobs relying on getting this pick right this year because this is such a good draft and there's going to be busts. Like there's going to be busts in the top 10 people. 100%. There's going to be two, maybe three. If you're one of those teams with the bust. That's your job. Like, this is a rich draft, and if you just so happen to draft the bust, your livelihood is done. So I don't think people are going to take that chance with a lot of these guys. So Metropolitan 92, everybody's obviously been watching Vic, but another kid, Bilal Koulibaly, he's really, Mm -hmm. really good, really fun. Mm -hmm. Mocs have him going as high as 9, as low as 15. Uh, There's been some hype around Sacramento trying to move up to try to get him. I Mm -hmm. think Vivek Ranadive, the owner of the Kings, went to his game. Mm -hmm. A lot of people were like, why would he go see Vic in France? A lot of people think it was for Bilal. Like, what do you think he could be? Is he the most, like, I guess, mystery I think he's the person that somebody trades up and they're like, oh, they're trading up. They're going to get, huh? Yeah. Who? Like, that's really what it's going to be. And I think, you know, when you come... Kind of like Usman Jang was last year with OKC. Yes, yes, exactly. Where it's like, you go in and get... You draft that guy, like, who... And it's the guy that is not on everybody's radar, but it's because Big Vic is just so polarizing. Nobody pays attention to the other guys around that team. Like, as good as he is, he was not the reason why they won games, like a bunch of games. Like, it's everybody else that came and helped them out. And so, especially when they came over here, I think it was Las Vegas, What was, and they played against G League at night. Like, that was a chance for a lot of people to open their eyes. So, I think he's one of those guys that can go kind of a trade. Maybe a Kings team does trade up and go get him, or somebody else does trade up and go get him. And everybody's like, oh, scratching their head. And then you look two, three years down the line, and you're like, that was a really, really great trade. And really yeah, really the uh, the Hawks have the 15th pick. That would be interesting. I think the Hawks are the Hawks could be – we'll see. They traded away a lot of picks for DeJounte Murray, but – They ought to get this one right. Trey Young could be out the door. And I'm waiting for something big to happen between now and Thursday, maybe even on Thursday. I'm waiting for something big. I don't know what it is. But it just feels like the Bradley Beal thing was a tease. That was the tease move. Draymond Green not taking the op, op, his player option. That was a tease move. But it feels like something big is around the corner where you're going to have a star move for a pick and some team is going to buy into the youth movement or just changing that team around. And Quinn Snyder, who won, the Hawks are not afraid to make changes because I don't think I can remember a coach coming in middle of the season. Yeah. Coaching, like coaching, full on coaching mid season. Now he has an off season to kind of plan things out. Does he want Trey Young around? It, is that the like is that the fit? We, I know we talked about a lot of mock situations and I mean the Lakers do have seventeen. Yeah. And seventeen is still a valuable pick in this draft. So could there be a situation where somebody anywhere says that, hey, we're going to take Trey Young and we'll give you one of our first-round picks. You think Trey Young going... only gets one first-round pick? I mean, it's going to be one uh, one of many. Like, he, they're yeah. going to get a haul for him, but a pick in this draft is 100% going to come. So yeah. is it going to be Trey Young? Uh, no, I'm not saying it's going to be Trey Young, but I think there is a possibility that a star from some, somebody somewhere moves prior to the draft and gives somebody, like, a player like, anybody we talked through through this lottery because this is a rich draft and I think the owners and the GMs and everybody in basketball sees it and says hey we may not have like a superstar but we're gonna have some really really good players that are gonna help us compete for championships in the future yeah and we saw with Denver role players especially role players that can play defense are so critical if you've got two guys 
one, obviously, that's a big man that can pass like Jokic and mm-hmm. a secondary scorer like Jamal Murray. Mm-hmm. What you need is to fill in the gaps. What's up with Taylor Hendricks? Like, what's up with him? I, I think he. I think he's. Because no one is talking about him, but he's mocked in every he's top, gonna be 10. In the top ten. He's going to be in the top ten. He's going to be in the top ten. Is he not it, the least talked about top ten player? It's either him or Walker. Yeah. I think it's either him or Walker. I think those are the two guys that people kind of like. I don't know what this guy looks like, <laughs> but I heard he's a really good basketball player, so we're just going to go ahead and go with that. But uh, Hendrix is interesting because I think he kind of fits the mold. Uh, and he's going to be one of those guys that you're going to take him in the top 10 and you're going to understand that he's he might not be a starter for you, but he's going to be a very, very good bench piece. And I think he like that's why I'm like there's so much trade potential here because if you're a contender, like you want somebody in this draft just to fill out that bench. Mm-hmm. Like imagine if Phoenix had some type of trade capital. Yeah. And they're sitting there saying, man, we would we like a cannot, Taylor Hendricks. We, yeah. we would like anybody to come play on the bench for us. Like there's so many Denver. I, so the funny thing about the parade with Denver is that Mike Malone was said he's Bruce B is coming back. No, he's not though, right? But he's it, Bruce. If Bruce Brown went back, I would probably say that his age. I would never sign with his agent if Bruce Brown signed another deal with the Denver Nuggets. Because the amount that Bruce Brown can get on the open market, they is thought probably that this deal was a terrible double. one. Yes, they said this deal was a terrible deal, and he should have never signed it. Now, it, hindsight looks amazing because he has a ring, and now he's going to command so much. I don't know if Malone was just, and if you, I, I was looking at Bruce Brown's reaction, he's like, like Come I on. like, I'm going to go get a bag. You like, can't pay me twelve yeah, million. Yeah, I can be a starter on many other teams. Like, so Denver is another one that, and I was talking about you on uh, uh, the other show. Yeah, Ben and Jim tonight. Yes, I was talking to you about that. Like, Denver is gonna need to reload that defense position. So, would it be surprising if Denver's Find some some type of capital and says I know that during the finals they had a swap with OKC and they and they did a pick swap with OKC or something like that. Like Denver yeah. could move up and be trying to go on to the next level and saying, "Hey, yeah, we're going to take one of these first two, one of these yeah. top fifteen guys and we're going to make them our six man." You give that OKC pick, you give your pick, and you try to move up into the top up. fifteen. Yeah, I am curious though. Also. Uh, I like Jalen Huchifino a lot. Mm-hmm. He's kind of a, a kid who could be like somewhere in the like 18 to 20. I've mm-hmm. seen him as going as high as 10, which is kind mm-hmm. of crazy. I don't think that's going to no. happen. Um, but he's 6'6". He can play good defense. He can do a bunch of different things. High IQ. Does a lot of interesting uh, training and conditioning that shows me that he cares about his body mechanics, like mm-hmm. his hip mobility is insane, yep. which I think is really important for basketball players at this mm-hmm. next level with this modern NBA. Like, where do you think he goes? I think he, and this is another one where. Like, would this be a warrior? Like, would this be a warrior's it, it pick? It feels like it could be a warrior's pick. And just of, we need some type of defense on the road. Yeah, like, like we literally need, we get rid of Jordan Poole yeah. and we add in yeah, Rick and you get And you get a defender. And then if you're Steve Kerr and the Warriors, you feel comfortable about anybody's offense and saying we can we can get the best out of anybody on offense. Like we can get something out of everybody. Even Gary the in the second, like he wasn't known highly for his offense. It was really just the defensive side of Paul. But you look at him on Golden State and he has games where he can get it going from three, where he can call move off ball and off ball movement you have to be willing to move off ball and if you're not able to do that if you're not conditioned and that's what i think i i like about him is that fact that he is conditioned because uh that's like what steve kerr does the entire workout yeah anthony edwards remember what anthony edwards said about his steve kerr workout and was like oh i did all this running he was like oh you're tired already steph does this like for a warm-up like you're, you're really tired like i know he's doing that with every player not just anthony edwards so I think that it could be a Warriors if a Warriors don't trade up and go make like a splash play. They could go for somebody, a safe option like that, come off the bench. You don't need stardom. You have stardom in Golden State. You just yeah. need somebody to come off the bench and play defense. And guess what? If Draymond Green really is gone, I don't think he's gone. I think they keep him. I think he comes back. I think it was just something to give the Warriors more flexibility to make this a championship roster because Draymond's a team yeah, player. Yeah, it takes like less that. now. Draymond's and, a team player. Yeah. Like everybody wants to make it seem like Draymond's only out for himself. He's really Maybe a team player. Maybe 15 this year, 20 the next year, 40 yeah. the year after that. I truly mm-hmm. believe contracts are a figment of the imagination. Like at, 
especially more in the NFL than the NBA, but definitely in the NBA when it comes to these player options and just saying, all right, we, we're going to decline this player option, but we're still going to resign you. We're going to resign you for less money. And we've seen a, a number of players do that. There was talk of Chris Paul going back, and there's still Chris. There's still talks of Chris Paul finding somehow to end his way back up in Phoenix because the Wizards probably aren't going to hold on to him if they don't trade him. And if they so, have to cut him, then he might just end up back there. And so it's like everybody's taking vet minimums and feel feels comfortable and like we made enough money. We just want to try to win championships. You don't see that as much in the NFL, but you see it a lot more in the NBA. So I think that Draymond could end his way back. So does that? take away from a guy like Jace or somebody else coming in defensively? Possibly. But if not, I think he would be a good fit and a good, not not saying replacement, but just somebody to help add to that side of the ball. Another couple teammates who are, I don't know what the difference is between them. I personally like Kobe Bufkin more than I like Jet Howard. I think mm -hmm. he'll get taken before Jet Howard. What do you think the biggest difference is between them instead, except for the size, right? Like Jet Howard, I think is six seven, six eight. Mm -hmm. Kobe Bufkin's five or uh, six five, six six. Mm -hmm. I think Co Kobe Bufkin has the higher floor, but Jet Howard Howard has the higher ceiling. Howard could very well be one of the top players in the draft when it's all said and done. Really, but it's in terms. Yes, I I think so. Just in terms of scoring, playmaking, all this other stuff, he very well could. But it depends on one development. Where, Development, fit, like that that's so many things. And that's the thing where I kind of, I really hate when teams just go best available because it's like best available might not be good for you. Like that's the whole yeah, debate that Charlotte is having right now. Are we going best available with Scoot Henderson or are we taking the best fit with Brandon Miller? Is the gap large between them? Absolutely not. But Brandon Miller is clearly a better fit for them with LaMelo handling the ball, but Scoot Henderson could be generational. And I ultimately, I think that they make the wrong mistake and they go with Scoot instead of Miller. While I do think, I, again, I think Scoot is the better player. But is he the better player for Charlotte? May not be. Question so, that I have for you, though, following up on that, is if you're Charlotte, what can you get for LaMelo right now on the open market? Oh, you could get the house, moon, stars, whatever you want. But you can't for the third overall, well, for the no, second overall yeah. pick. So what you could do is just take Scoot and then you trade LaMelo. Yeah. You have them play together. And then when you need to, you move Lamelo for four first round picks. Especially and some if you young don't players. think Lamelo is going to resign, I think that's yeah. like the conversation that teams are having. And that was the conversation when they f first drafted him. Like, is Lamelo? Is this just a one rookie contract pony? And Lamelo dips off to a larger market, like possibly. So, I and that's ultimately what I think kind of happens here. I think it is a situation. And we're talking long term. Like there's some dynasty basketball players that that are uh, that are listening and like, oh, I'm loving this because I would love to see Lamelo move on to a bigger market, a different team. But like, I think that's ultimately the conversation Charlotte is having. What's our chances of retaining Melo? Because while we do get the incentives of max super max contracts for staying with your team, original team, but if he is on the move. Scoot is a at very good replacement for when we don't have him. One, what is LaMelo's availability? Again, best ability is availability, and he may not be there. So Scoot could be that for them as well. Or do you just buy in all in on LaMelo being a Charlotte Hornet? If you're buying all in on that, you go Brandon Miller. I know we kind of got on a tangent in talking about these two, but like that is just the – it just – there's – I don't remember the last time that such a big decision has been made at two. Normally it's just plug and play, go with it, John Morant easy like you're gonna you're taking John Morant you're not questioning RJ Barrett like I it's not one of those situations you really got to think through this is LaMelo a Hornet for long term if no you're going Scoot if so you're going Brandon Miller all right so outside of uh players outside of the top three and who do you think well outside of the who do you think is the biggest riser in Nick this Smith. draft, besides Nick, Nick Smith. Smith. Besides <laughs> Nick Smith. I'm sorry. I'm I'm all so. So we're gonna take Smith. him off. The, yes. Who do you think is the biggest surprise? Fall and rise outside of Nick Smith. The biggest fall, I think, is I think it's potentially Grady Dick. Just because I don't I don't know if teams are hundred percent bought into making it work instead of just like they like there's so many teams that just want to kind of plug and play i don't think he's a plug and play i think it's somebody that you have to make it work and understand he probably is going to come off the bench for you for a few years uh the biggest riser hmm. 
I don't know if I want to go with Lively because I don't know if I can. But if I think you're towards the back end of the lottery and I can see you. Like, if Orlando sat here and took him at six, I would not be surprised. Really? I, I wouldn't. And it's just because, like, I think that Rudy Gobert just put a bad taste in people's mouth about the shot blocking big. But that is so paramount when you just think about what happened in the Boston series where everybody was getting to the rim and it didn't matter. When you look at now you have Jokic, who you need somebody to guard him. And at least, at the very least, you have Lively who can actually get a hand in his face, unlike everybody else who kind of just puts a hand up and Jokic is like... Yeah, can't see him. Oh, I, I, I didn't know somebody was guarding me. That's what it looked like in the NBA yeah. Finals. And so I think Jokic is... And we talk about people that owe people checks. Lively probably is going to owe Jokic a check because that NBA Finals is fresh. And for me, a lot of this stuff is less about basketball, more about narratives. And so if there's a team, and I, I do think is a Golden State is a contender, but there's a number of contenders that can use rim protection. It, you, Memphis is a team nobody's talking about right now that they've drafted really, really well in the draft. I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that they say, all right, we're moving up this year to go get somebody because Steven Adams wasn't available when we needed him. And, you know, we need more defense. And we saw that that was really the reason why we lost move to young, the Lakers. Yeah, move their pick, yeah. move a couple of players, and now you all Easy of a like that. You have in... so much good young talent that yep. is perfectly fine. They drafted so well that Memphis is a 10 deep team that people don't realize. Like they have, and even, I mean, their G League team won the championship with right. Lofton. And so I think that a Memphis is a team that contender, like, like Lively just gives me, you know, what everybody wanted. Wise men to be on the defensive end, not the offensive end, but the defensive end. And if you're sitting here telling me that I have somebody that can potentially either now or maybe in the next year or even the next year after that, neutralize a Joel Embiid, neutralize a Giannis, neutralize a Jokic, that is invaluable. And so I can I can see Lively rising as far as five, as six. I wow. think truly as far as six, I can see him getting up there. But I can also see them falling to the 12, 13 range. So it's just like, will these teams decide that I'm going to trade for a shot blocking big? And that would not be the, a surprise to me at all. Last question before we let you run. Is Zion a member of the New Orleans Pelicans on Friday? Yes. Really? He He's still there on Friday. Does he finish the season? That is something to talk about. But I think at the very least, we get him to the season. He gets there to the season, and then as the season goes on, they may be like, all right, we're done with this. We're not doing this experiment anymore. But on Friday, he's he's still he's still a Pelican. That's Terrell Furman, host of the NBA and WNBA Sports Gambling Podcast on the Sports Gambling Podcast Network. Give him a follow on Twitter. His picks on WNBA are some of the best <laughs> that I've ever seen. And I mean this. In a year where everyone is getting just straight murdered, it is just lovely for you. Mm -hmm. uh, you can find him at at really rel, uh, underscore on Twitter. And uh, do you have anything else to there, Two underscores. Two underscores. Yeah, so two underscores. at really rel, R E L L. Yeah, the guy that has one underscore. underscore doesn't tweet at all. And so if you follow him, you're going to be very, very mistaken. A lot of clips up there. A lot of takes up there. Definitely follow his podcast. Thanks so much for coming on. Hey, thank you. I appreciate it. it was Super fun. insightful.